Good evening, and welcome to the Virtual Einstein Forum. Of course, I wish we were all together tonight, but on the other hand, the chances of our being able to pull together this particular uh, dream team, uh, Stephen from Corfu at the moment, and Kerry from Woodstock, New York, is not high. I say dream team because I have been hearing for quite a long time that Stephen Greenblatt, who's been a guest of the Einstein Forum before uh, several times, had uh, published a book in which he managed to perfectly analyze the American political situation without ever mentioning the words Donald Trump, but solely uh, through reading the works of Shakespeare, which is perhaps uh, one of the greatest living experts, as most of you will know. Um, Stephen Greenblatt is a university professor of humanities at Harvard. And when Stephen kindly said he'd be glad to join us and talk about that book, Tyrant, um, I began to think, well, who would be the right person to talk with him? And of course, the first person who occurred to me was Carrie Harrison, who is one of my very favorite contemporary writers, a member of the board of the Einstein Forum, and uh, also has done serious work as a Shakespearean actor. And then I thought, well, I can ask Carrie, but you know, it's always possible that they met at a party 25 years ago and had a fight, or one of them gave a bad review of the other's book. So I wrote to Carrie saying, uh, what do you think about this? He said, Stephen and I have been friends for 50 years since we first met at Cambridge and began telling me all kinds of lovely stories. So um, besides, of course, being a writer of wonderful fiction and a large number of plays for radio, and stage, Carrie Harrison is a professor of humor at Brooklyn College. Uh, I welcome you both. I welcome you all. Um, and for those of you who are listening, uh, the um, Carrie and Stephen will talk about Stephen's latest book for 45 minutes to an hour, and then we will be happy to take your questions. Please put them in the Q and A function at the bottom right of your screen, uh, or F and A if you're listening to this in English. Welcome, gentlemen. You need to turn on your cameras. Turn on your engines. Oops, there we are. And, the and let's see if that is working. Stephen is there. There I am. This is myself, and there's Carrie. Okay. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> oh, Susan, this is wonderful. Um, it's strange because uh, Stephen looks so young, and I'm not helping the comparison by sporting this uh, Tolstoyan beard. That it it seems unlikely that we would have met on a level playing field all those years ago. <laughs> but we the did. Beard is, the beard is uh, impressive. I would have thought of Darwin really uh, first and Thank foremost. <laughs> happy to be happy to be sporting a Darwinian beard. But we we met at uh, uh, pretty much the same stage of our studies in Cambridge. And it's so wonderful to find myself uh, once more uh, talking to Stephen, uh, really one of the jewels of uh, my life. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm just so delighted that this uh, uh, turned out this way. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to take it on myself, if I may, uh, to recommend Stephen's book to everybody, um, not only to people for whom scholarly literature has a natural place on their bookshelves, but also to people who don't and are struck uh, by the title and the urgency of the question of uh, tyranny in our time at all times, arguably, but particularly now, and uh, would, would accept a recommendation from somebody who is not uh, a true scholar, more of an accidental scholar, 
based on the fact that, that Stephen is so accessible uh, to audiences of all degrees of uh, literary expertise and familiarity, that uh, if ever you were to decide to pick up a book of Shakespearean scholarship, this is at this moment uh, the one to pick up. Thank Stephen you. has a, a, a long and glorious history as a Shakespearean scholar. He, one of the things in which we are lucky in our generation uh, is that we have Stephen in it. Um, one of the greatest Shakespearean scholars and readers uh, ever over these past 400 years. And here he is still with us um, and we had, as are his books. And so we have the opportunity to delve into Shakespeare's life and times and work through his extraordinarily uh, knowledgeable eyes and uh, his erudition and, and above all his supreme familiarity with the period at which Shakespeare wrote, which has not always been of primary concern uh, to readers of, of Shakespeare, certainly in periods over the last 400 years when uh, readers admired uh, the sonority of the verse without actually knowing very much about Elizabethan politics. And it has been a fascinating subject now for a long time, certainly during my lifetime, to speculate uh, with regards to Shakespeare's place uh, in the political scene. Um, and no one uh, will give you a better sense of this and of the complexities uh, of life and the choices that Shakespeare had to make uh, than Stephen. What is extraordinary about this book, as uh, Susan mentioned, is not only that he manages to make it uh, a book, uh, which is a complete uh, uh, dissection of the life and times of Donald Trump. Um, not only does he achieve this without mentioning uh, Trump's name, but what is so elegant about this achievement is that this is actually what Shakespeare was doing. As, as Stephen makes extremely clear, uh, Shakespeare had to manage to walk the tightrope of the issues that he raised uh, without actually uh, mentioning any of the contemporary participants in, in the, uh, the drama of, of politics and in the drama of tyranny. And Shakespeare was uh, brilliant at covering the ground, uh, implying uh, what to, educated members of his audience would have been absolutely clear uh, in terms of his reference points and does so uh, without uh, getting himself into trouble because here uh, Shakespeare's motives and Stephen's are somewhat different. Stephen uh, didn't have to worry about uh, being uh, pilloried, put in the stocks uh, for making it clear who um, his book was referring to other than Shakespeare himself. Shakespeare, on the other hand, uh, was lived in a time of, of great danger uh, of uh, seesawing politics when, as I struggle to explain to my students, who, for whom Protestant and Catholic England mean nothing as a pair of polarities, uh, how the pendulum swung uh, during Shakespeare's life and how, how extraordinarily various have been the theories of what Shakespeare's politics were and what his father's politics were and how he managed to circumvent, uh, how he managed to, to get through the minefield that politics were in his time. Um, so in reading uh, Stephen's wonderful book, you get a double treat. You get uh, the, the exquisite humor of Stephen not having to clarify for us uh, who Shakespeare's <laughs> references now remind us of, and the pleasure of, of seeing how deftly uh, Shakespeare told uh, uh, his stories, uh, moving back into history um, in a way that uh, the French classical dramatists did for a, a different reason. And I always think of, of uh, Racine insisting that uh, the, the tragic grandeur of the past was his reason uh, for not writing uh, about contemporaries. And in Shakespeare's case, uh, that effectively is true, although he's not declaring it to be his reason, and he has a much better reason, uh, which was to say a great deal about the present uh, without referencing it. So, um, as I say, you have this wonderful double treat, uh, a, a brilliant anatomy uh, of, of Shakespeare's plays, and also 
a, a wonderful portrayal of how to tiptoe through the tulips, um, which, <laughs> which Stephen does without, I think, needing to, but doing so out of a matter of supreme tact. Uh, though the temptation, unless I'm wrong, must have been quite strong at, at some times to make your, your message even more clear. Um, uh, not really, Carrie. For, for, uh, first of all, let me thank you. Thank Susan and thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And I feel after your generous, uh, immensely generous words, quite abashed uh, since everything I say from here on in will be uh, certainly uh, downhill. But in terms of the issue that you raise, which is crucial, why not simply shout out yeah. Whatever you want to shout out, this, I wouldn't the, uh, get in the least bit of trouble that no. way. Uh, I'm happy to say because uh, for all of the the uh, defects of our system, that's not uh, one of our uh, terrible defects. Uh, but it's something like the reverse, and the and it it goes with my decision not to speak about the present. There's lots of different reasons for it, but one is simply that that I think that the sophisticated uh, tyrants, if that's the right word for it, of today, I mean, since there are many different versions of this all around in the world, there's, they have names like Orban and Putin and Duterte, and uh, we could continue the list and Erdogan. And, uh, but in, in some sense, the most sophisticated uh, of these people, of these cultures, found out that you don't actually have to cut people's tongues out or nail their ears to the pillory. It's better actually instead, there are still people who do this, but it's better instead they found just to make a tremendous racket, to make a huge amount of noise. And that amount of noise is so deafening, uh, is so constantly in everyone's ears that you can't think straight any longer about what's going on. And uh, I must say that our Donald Trump uh, of, of uh, uh, recent memory, uh, unlamented memory, was unbelievably good at making noise. Yes. He still is, but now they've, they've quieted him down a little bit thanks to restrictions on his Twitter account and Facebook. But what was in, there are many things impressive about the, these four years, but in some sense, the most impressive piece of it was that you couldn't get him out of your head. Mm. You couldn't get the noise, the sound of his voice, the noise out of your head. And I imagine that, that this must have been the case in the 1930s in Germany. You just couldn't clear your head of this racket that was constantly going on. So that it was, an, to me, a liberation of a profound political liberation. Mm. Uh, to think about what is going on without invoking that particular noise, to get the brain worm to be quiet for a moment. That makes so much sense. Uh, what is remarkable to me is that uh, Shakespeare had, a, had such a comprehensive sense of the ways in which a tyrant established himself, or uh, in some sense also referencing Elizabeth herself, um, as if he had lived under Stalin. Um, it, it's so prophetic, it's so subtle psychologically, his understanding of what induces people to submit to it. I'm, I'm dazzled by it when I read your book. I think he must have thought that his political landscape, the only world political world he knew, after all, in his own world, uh, in, in his own times, was vulnerable to this, particularly vulnerable to this disease. It, after all, had almost no uh, structural restraints, uh, given the, the it had some restraints because of the way uh, the parliamentary control of the purse, uh, right. but it, it actually had almost none of the constitutional restraints that with which all modern states, uh, uh, more right. or less liberal democratic states, are accustomed. And I, so I think he must have thought, and in some sense, it's the most important, I think, lesson, if that is a possible word for of his work, which is that you have to be 
constantly thinking about this, on your guard, uh, yes. constantly doing the work of of protecting whatever uh, liberty that you have. Yes. So I think I think anyone living in in that particular one thing that has happened in America is that at least for myself is that I feel much re uh, more how should we say modest than I used to feel about our our system and about the way in which it uh, uh, protects itself yes. from folly. I understand now better than I did before how much it can submit to. Yes. Uh, to danger, to folly. I think Shakespeare didn't need that lesson. No. Because it's built into right. everything about his his world, from Henry VIII to the successor Edward, to the successor Mary, to the successor Elizabeth, the crazy gambles that were taken for dynastic reasons when, yeah. when the next person came in. That's right. No, it's, 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 it's extraordinary. And when you uh, read Hilary Mantel's uh, Henry VIII novels, as it were, her Cromwell novels. Yes. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's frightening just to think of living under, never mind being an ambitious human being, living under uh, someone like Henry VIII, who was not that long ago for Englishmen in Shakespeare's time. The father, who, of, the father of the reigning monarch. Exactly. And who, who in so many ways represents that the terrifying arbitrariness of power, uh, the swing of the pendulum, uh, which to a, a rather timid person like me would just make me want to flee the court and flee any centers of power that I could and become a humble farmer or fisherman immediately. I couldn't stand this, the pressure. Yes, there, there's a poem uh, called The Booge of Court written uh, under Henry VIII, in Henry VIII's time, by a poet named Skelton. Yes. Kind of, as you know, a kind of uh, precursor of rap poetry, uh, <laughs> rap. Uh, uh, and he, the central character, it's about being at court, and the central character is called Dread. Dread, because that is the experience of yes. being at court. Uh, and a hundred years later, roughly, Sir Walter Raleigh in prison in the tower. Of London wrote in the early 17th century a a, uh, a uh, history of the world, in which he made in the introductory section some remark about Henry VIII as the most terrifying model of of a tyrant. That if you look at the whole history of the world that Raleigh could think of, uh, but then Raleigh was asked. Why he if, why he decided to write a history of the world beginning with the uh, with the Greeks and the Romans and when he knew so much about his own time, why didn't he write about his own time? And he said he writes, "He who follows truth too close at the heels will get his teeth kicked out." <laughs> uh, and that's also a Shakespearean early seventeenth century yes. understanding of what is at stake when you are are getting anywhere close to your own time it's very it's very true and it's very good and of course uh we can imagine uh or pick i can picture for myself uh shakespeare's understanding of a courtier's life and you know it that was already uh wrapped up in the fascination of the english with italian courts and treachery and 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 danger um and, and there were models from abroad as well as as from england itself and I, I simply uh, read that and think of that in, in, in relief that I don't have any such ambitions. But I can identify much more clearly with the populace and uh, desperately wanting a change, uh, somebody to follow, uh, a leader. And what we all, I think, grow up with, those of us who, who are introduced to Shakespeare early, is a sense that, that Shakespeare gives us of the fickleness of the crowd, um, obviously in, in, you know, in the spotlight in plays like Julius Caesar, but throughout the canon, um, he shows you how easily turned uh, they are. And that's what I thought of as his portrayal uh, of, of, the, of the populace in, in the political dimension. But what's so clear reading your book is how brilliantly he understood uh, 
what wiles the leader uh, used from Jack Cade right up to uh, kings and queens to, uh, to mesmerize uh, the, the public and turn them in any direction uh, that he or she wanted. Uh, you expose that most wonderfully. He, he really understood the psychology of crowds. I think that's true. I think, I think his view of this evolved and deepened in complex ways in the course of his lifetime. That is to say, I think that his account in the earliest plays in which he represents the crowd, that is to say the Henry VI plays, uh, sees the crowd as uh, terrifyingly uh, malleable, uh, as straws in the wind, uh, and ready for violence. And that, in some sense, continues all the way through. But by, by a late play like Coriolanus, I think he gives the crowd much more, how should we say, credit for uh, a sympathetic credit for the, the plight that they're in, for the, right. the misery that they're in. Uh, yes. You get glimpses of this early on, but you don't get it completely in focus. It, it's worth remembering, Carrie knows this, but, but people listening may not know this, that uh, the 16th century had a legal system uh, in some ways, a very impressive legal system because the, it was a, a, a unusually for Europe a jury system, uh, which you could be judged by your peers. But there was a special regulation called benefit of clergy. Benefit of clergy meant uh, it was a strange thing to have survived into the 16th century. It meant that it, there were two different court systems. There was a secular court system and a clerical religious court system. And the religious court system didn't have the death penalty. The, 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 so it was obviously an enormous advantage to be tried in the, in, uh, the, the religious church court system. How did you get tried in a church court rather than a secular court if you could show that you could read? Because if you could show you could read, you were treated legally as if you were a clergyman as if you were a minister. And I've just spent some time in the last few months reading through court records, which are terrifying from the 16th century because it's terrifying simply for the sheer numbers of people being executed. Constant execution, six, seven, eight, 10 a day for tiny, by our standards, tiny offenses. And very often in these records, there'll be three people arrested for the basically the same crime, one of them will read, will show that he could read what was called your neck verse. The neck verse being a passage, a, a, a verse from the Psalms, which you, you didn't have to show you understood it, but you had to be able to read it out loud. And if you could read it out loud, you weren't executed. You were moved into the church courts. Uh, so picture a system in which the vast number, the vast majority of people are illiterate, they can't read. And those people are executed in very large numbers and a small number of people who are by no means all clergymen, in fact, almost none of them were, get out of this, get put into the church court system where they're, you, you, could get, you could be branded, they would put a little M or a little T on your hand for murder or a thief, because uh, you couldn't get away with it a second time, but you could escape the hangman, uh, just if you could read. Think of the rage oh. that you would feel if you oh. were one of the people who was subject to this treatment because That's you right. couldn't read. And Shakespeare, to give him credit early on in Henry VI, represents that rage. Yes. Uh, it, it, and it's moving, I should say as an American, it's moving to me because as an American of my type, class, background, every uh, educational background, it's exceedingly difficult for me to understand yes. the rage that is was behind yes. the election of Donald Trump. Yes, I, absolutely. I write it off uh, partly, I think, correctly, as racist, uh, as uh, uh, the, the sum of all the viciousness that floats around in our system. But 
that's actually not adequate to the situation at all. I recognize that it's not like, it's a kind of failure of the civic imagination on mm -hmm. my part. And Shakespeare has early on a kind of civic imagination. Shakespeare was after all yes, fully yes. literate, but his, yes. he came from an illiterate family. Yes. Uh, and he understands just the anger that is seething. Oh, absolutely. And you, of course, this is the long, long lead in uh, to the terrible story uh, told, I think, by Malaparte in Caput, uh, where uh, a whole lot of prisoners are rounded up, I think, on the Russian side, it would make more sense, and given the chance to distinguish themselves from their peers by reading. And there, there's a book there, and they try and read, and as soon as they try and fail, they're put in one group, and those who succeed uh, smugly go into the other group and are promptly shot. Yes, uh, because there's a world in which we don't want uh, uh, these uh, intellectual smarts at all. Yeah. Let's just have farm workers. So, it, and it's terrifying to read because it makes you think of think of those people desperately trying to prove they could read in the centuries in which it would have saved their life. Yes, yes, yes. That that is uh, that uh, attaches to something else which I think Shakespeare understood quite well, uh, which is the difficulty that you have that everyone has in gaming the system. Yes. When your life depends upon it. Uh, in figuring out how you have the right, if the equivalent would be figuring out as the fate of many people in the 20th century dependent, how you figure out how to get the right papers, which yes. are the right papers. And then what happens when those papers aren't the right papers? And how do you get the next set of papers? And you have Shakespeare's quite good, powerful, I think, at depicting the scrambling yes. that uh, people have in frightening situations, uh, in figuring out how to save themselves, That's um, right. what, the, what the path is that will lead to survival. Oh, it's terrifying. I was listening to a story on the, the moth uh, storytelling hour of uh, an Afghan family who had managed to escape uh, with forged papers and made it to America, whereupon they were promptly dispatched uh, uh, back home because one should not acquire the right to live in a free country on forged papers. In fact, it was a story with a happy ending and uh, the, uh, uh, the father stood up in court and stripped off and showed his, the scars that he had endured uh, at the hands of the regime. And the, uh, until then, uh, flinty-eyed judge relented and, and, and came down nice and, and yeah, yeah, terrifying, right. terrifying. Carrie, give me a half a second to turn on the lights because it's uh, oh, really getting, do, getting dark. Do, 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 the better we can see you, the, the happier I will be. Good. At some point, and now is not necessarily the moment, because I, I, I really, uh, uh, the, the longer I can uh, listen to Stephen talking about Shakespeare, I'd have him talk all day. But I'm curious uh, as to whether our, our uber rubric uh, of literature in the, uh, at the time of, of siege um, is, a, is a broad, uh, inclusive rubric for many, many interviews and talks and hours uh, bends towards Shakespeare, which is a wonderful thing for it to do, or whether we're being invited to consider the matter of literature at a time of siege. Um, because I was going to pour the most terrible bucket of, of cold water on this. And if I do so, then <laughs> maybe Stephen will rescue me from my own embarrassment, because every time I, I turned my mind uh, to that phrase and to that thought, uh, I realized that in fact, literature, in my experience, is perpetually in under a state of siege. Uh, I mean, Stephen and I, as teachers, are not uh, benefited uh, by the pandemic. Um, we lose the social existence that we have as teachers. But as writers, as much Stephen as myself, uh, if we're given uh, solitude and time 
in which to make use of that solitude. Uh, you know, it, it's actually a natural condition uh, of literature that, uh, of certain kinds of literature at any rate, but, but certainly uh, for uh, writers like Stephen and myself, we are given an opportunity by the state of siege. And perhaps in my case, somewhat guiltily, I, I feel that we're, we are acquiring this freedom um, at the expense of terrible suffering across the world, uh, but it hasn't made it any less pleasant for me. I have to. Are you, you're con are you confessing that you had a good pandemic, Terry? <laughs> I'm afraid I am. I'm sorry to have to declare that. And you know, I, I, it is an ill wind uh, that blows no one any good, and so I, I can at least claim <laughs> that, that this is uh, uh, traditional. There's always some soul who benefits from the storm. Um, I think it's, I think, by the way, that it is worth thinking about states of siege in relation to certainly in relation to uh, Shakespeare, but not, yes, as you say, sure. not only in relation to Shakespeare, but but over a long period of time. With varying degrees of of uh, protection from the worst conditions, the phrase art in a state of siege, I think that I encountered it in William Kentridge, the South African artist. Uh, where he is writing, I think, in the first of all, in, in reference to a very literal and very uh, dire experience of being besieged, it's worth thinking about. I think the fact that that most of the cities that we look at, certainly in the, in Europe, were built. One of the things we find charming about them are their old crumbling walls and their defensive fortifications. Those are all structures. Uh, built in expectation of being besieged uh, and uh, uh, figuring out how to survive in that situation. In a broader sense, uh, in the 16th, you have the you have to picture the 16th century, the, the the world into which Shakespeare was born, very much as you would picture the 20th century if someone lived as very few people were able to live a long life, having been born in the early 20th century in Germany. Uh, and living through that whole century with with terrifying, impossible changes in regime and terrifying experiences uh, of of oppression, war, horror, and so forth. That is the uh, the world coupled with, of course, epidemic disease in Shakespeare's time as well. Let's yes. say outbreaks of of plague. Uh, so, I mean, there is a, a odd way in which all of Shakespeare's works, all of uh, the works of his contemporaries, Marlowe, Johnson, and so forth, were, and, and that was also true on the continent, uh, in, in France and Italy, were written by people for whom siege was a primary uh, human experience. And they had to figure out, as we all have to figure out, as you managed evidently to figure out, what's the way we're, I'm going to survive? And yes. not only survive, but be creative yes. in this situation. How can I, I have only one time round. I'm not going to have another life. This is, uh, I'm going to live my life in these conditions. How can I be as creative as I can? Well, that's right. I mean, there, nonetheless, there is a, there is a luxury to it, um, to be uh, obliged as well as, as, as permitted to uh, focus only on the creatures of your imagination. Um, is something that you steal from uh, from social time and social existence. Uh, but uh, under the circumstances of a pandemic, when you, you're told, uh, you're sternly told you must stay home, <laughs> then, then uh, uh, you, it, it's, it's like you're, you're on, a, on a, a private uh, stipend from yes. history. Yes. Um, yes, when Shakespeare's case, as you know, when he was told he had to stay home in effect, that is to say, when the plague, the plague deaths, when they reached a certain point in England, they shut the theaters down. Yes. Uh, that was a sensible thing to do, uh, we now understand. Uh, they, they shut the theaters down because they thought God might disapprove of the theater. They, weren't, they were less concerned about, about epidemiological questions. Right. Uh, but when they shut the theaters down during periods of plague, Shakespeare wrote his, his long, great long poems. Yeah. Maybe as you've just been writing yeah. a, a novel, uh, he wrote but, Venus and Adonis, he wrote The Rape of Lucrece, 
He probably yes. wrote many of his sonnets when he yes. couldn't write for the theater. That's right. That's right. Yes, it, it is. It's, it's a gift to not very many people, but, uh, but writers are among those who, who do benefit. Um, and, then, and then we have the great social life that, that Shakespeare lived and we, and we try and figure out uh, when he might have uh, gone back to Stratford and for how long, and then back once again to London. I um, think, I mean, you know, he, he went back, clearly he went back relatively often to, to buy real estate. Yes. Uh, we, he was investing in country real estate. Yes, he was. Uh, and, uh, and he, must, he must have gone back to see his parents uh, and then his, and also his wife and his three children, and then uh, one died. But I think that, that uh, my guess, but I, of course we don't know, my guess is that he had rather limited time yes. to go back. He, his was a fantastically busy life. Yes. When the theaters were uh, up and running. And I think that he probably had relatively few occasions. It was a, it was a yes. serious enterprise to get from London to Stratford. That's I don't right. think he could take several weeks off no. uh, to do this. So no, I think, and that actually becomes quite interesting in relation to his decision. This is, this is actually not uh, as much a detour from our subject as it may seem he made a decision in in when he was uh, in his mid 40s to retire and mm. it was at the height of his powers mid 40s yes. then is is not very different from mid 40s now that is say you are physically alert and alive right. he made the decision to go back to stratford and exactly at that point he wrote a play about someone in his mid 40s who's done something terrible to his wife and family, who's screwed up everything right. personally, and who's behaved like a tyrant to go to our subject for today, and who yes. thinks somehow I can, I can make good on it, or yes. actually in, in effect, who goes through a long period of repentance and does eventually get back what he thought he had ruined forever. Yes. So uh, I don't think Shakespeare probably personally did get it back. He didn't live very long after he moved oh. back to Stratford. But I think he was having a dream that he could somehow make up for what he had done, which was a, in effect to abandon his wife and children. That's right. Uh, and pursue his career. That's right. I have a, a Shakespeare loving uh, friend who is uh, an immunologist um, of, of, of great fame and glory and is obsessed with Shakespeare. So when we meet, uh, he's a Brit, uh, but he teaches part of the year here and part in Britain. Uh, it, it's Shakespeare that we must talk about. And he, he would, I think, uh, inject me with some uh, completely impossible poison, impossible to recover from if I did not take the opportunity to uh, run in front of you, uh, one of his pet theories, he's convinced uh, on obscure medical grounds, I think, but convinced that Shakespeare died of uh, excessive mercury poisoning. From, um, syphil from treatment of syphilis? Yes, well, or, or from warding, warding off syphilis. At any rate, from too much, too much mercury uh, and mercury uh, uh, poisoning. And uh, if you had any thoughts on that, I would love to be able to tell him <laughs> that, yes. that he may be uh, correct. It's possible. I mean, there, we, we, we know that in Shakespeare's play, Troilus and Cressida, uh, there's a, what seemed to be a kind of obsessive yeah. brooding about uh, syphilitic yes, there is. illness. And that's repeated in different forms also in several of the other later plays. Uh, so it's quite possible that Shakespeare, who was almost certainly leading, how should we say, an irregular life, uh, in London uh, at, at a time in which the syphilis, which had always been around, had become enormously worse because of, the, uh, it, it, of a, a mutation having to do with the uh, voyages to the New World. Right. Um, and it's entirely possible that, that Shakespeare had received one of those ghastly treatments yes. uh, that uh, involved Mercury. Of course, the more money you had in this period, uh, the more horrifying your medical treatment was. Uh, 
you were better <laughs> off in the 16th century actually having very little money. I mean, and not being able to afford what doctors could do to you. That's right. And yes. Shakespeare at that point had money. Yes. So it's possible that he was treated uh, in the somewhat desperate way yes. uh, that uh, doctors were treating syphilis. Good. I shall point that out to John. That's absolutely right. <laughs> I knew I knew I could. It's 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 unfair. But when uh, you find yourself uh, talking as I am now uh, to somebody who knows a tremendous amount about a topic, it's it's fun to ask them to chase into the woods and uh, <laughs> down unfamiliar paths, because there will always be the riches of your reading and thinking will, will we shall hear them. My speculations are about Shakespeare and syphilis are, I would say, not worth uh, an enormous uh, yeah. uh, amount of trust. But it is, it's possible. It yeah. is, and, and I'm not the first person, as your friend is not the first person to speculate. No. Uh, right. I, I think what is clear, to me at least, is that Shakespeare expected to live, didn't think he was dying when he moved back to Stratford. The reason that's clear is he purchased an annuity, in the, what we would call an annuity, uh, that really depended upon, to, to, make, to make, make sense, it depended upon his having a relatively long life longer than he had. Uh, he seems to have become ill fairly soon uh, after returning home. Yes, that's right. Uh, so I think uh, life was always uncertain, is always uncertain, was certainly uncertain at that time. But actually then, as now, if you succeeded in living into your 30s and then living into your 40s, you could reasonably expect to live into your 50s. And yes. Shakespeare's mother, lived a good long life. Yes. Uh, and so I think he probably did, uh, poor man, wish, uh, imagine that he was going to live with the wife he had abandoned and the daughters yes. with whom he had, one of whom he loved, one of whom he had a troubled relationship and his granddaughter. Right. I imagine he thought he was gonna live uh, um, a longer life than he- Exactly, I'm in sure. Fact, he wind up living. <sighs> Unlike uh, Christopher Marlowe, his right. uh, great contemporary, who and so many of the the, the uh, people that Shakespeare knew and worked with when he was in in full career, uh, Thomas Kidd, Christopher Marlowe, uh, uh, Anthony Mundy, uh, all the writers, and there's so many of the uh, Robert Greene. Uh, Thomas Lodge, so many of the writers in this period died very, very young. Thomas Nash yes. uh, in their 20s and 30s, uh, either of plague, of drunkenness and disease, of the case of Marlowe getting a knife stuck in your eye. Uh, but Shakespeare managed, and that returns to something you said at the beginning, Shakespeare somehow figured out how to say what to our way of thinking, understanding the period, were very dangerous things. Yes, uh, and and not get nailed for it. Well, uh, he, he, the 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 fate of Khashoggi, the reporter, uh, suggests that it is unusual in our world, but it wasn't unusual in Shakespeare's world. No. Uh, that and Shakespeare knew that. So, if you said uh, in the tavern. A dog's obeyed an office. Yes. Or if you said, yes. it's a heretic that makes the fire, not she that burns in it. If you said words like that, uh, you could easily be executed. Yes. In this period. And well, Shakespeare means. has characters say those words in front of 3,000 people yes. multiple afternoons and get away with it. Why? Because they're said by the first case by King Lear, madness in an ancient world. In right. the second case by a character called Paulina in Sicily, in a kind of magical world. That's it's right. possible because of the theater in Shakespeare's time to say things that can't be said anywhere else. And that's to return for a moment to my book. That's where Please. I started with the fact that 
that of understanding that things could be said uh, in this form at this time that couldn't be said uh, or in ordinary circumstances in Shakespeare's world. And that you Shakespeare was living, how should we say, living in Saudi Arabia, the GDR, contemporary Iran, uh, in, in the uh, societies that did not actually tolerate wide range of free speech about contemporary conditions. That's right. And he had to figure out how to fashion a language for himself and for his, co his contemporaries, yes. because people can't be silent. And the state knew that they can't be silent. And that's in some sense why they allowed the theater. Because yes. uh, they had people, it's like Midas's wife, they have to go if necessary, into the reeds and start talking to the reeds and saying, the king has ass his ears. Uh, and the theater was one of those places in which uh, the state, the society made a decision, we'll treat this place as if it doesn't matter what people say. That's right. Because they're characters. You want to say a dog's obeyed an office? Go ahead and say it, but don't say it outside the theater. Mm -hmm. You say it outside the theater, you're screwed. That's right. Uh, but in the theater, okay. And that screen, that aesthetic screen, was a political screen that protected you, and that Shakespeare was the supreme master of figuring out how to use that screen. Uh, and not simply to say things that couldn't be said, but to think things, mm. to think them through. And then, away for me, that was that's one of the reasons that it was exciting and fun to think about our own contemporary politics through Shakespeare, not only because, as they say, we can say whatever we want, not only because he was so clever at saying the things, but because the space that he had enabled him to think about the nature of politics in a way he probably couldn't, in a way that I find it difficult to think about them if I get too caught up mm -hmm. in what is happening right now in the daily newspaper, in the give us our daily dose of our monstrous this or that. That's right. Take a step back into a different world. That's right. Yes, I, I mean, it, I, sometimes I imagine I'm Ben Johnson and I'm, I'm looking at Will and I'm thinking, the son of a bitch. Uh, he, he has none of my education. He has none of my formal letters. Um, somehow, he hasn't got himself into the trouble that I've got myself into. He tiptoes between the tulips. His plays about the ancient world are strangely about now, whereas my plays about the ancient world are all about then. And uh, because you feel that what must have been uh, awe-inspiring is that, uh, maybe not completely obvious to, to his contemporaries, but when he moves to Rome in his imagination, he's more at home than he is anywhere uh, on the globe or in history. It's extraordinary how his spirit relaxes and the Roman gods who are much more real to him uh, than certainly than the Greek gods, it's, it's very hard uh, to take the idea of a Midsummer Night's Dream as uh, seriously as taking place in ancient Greece. But, uh, but the Roman plays take place in his, his Rome. His Rome is wonderfully immediate uh, and, and localized. And in some ways I feel he didn't have to invent or reinvent city drama. He, that was a real place to him. Um, it, it, it must have been jaw-dropping for his contemporaries, I think. Yes, uh, that's a wonderful way of putting it, Carrie. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's true that Shakespeare's imagination was set on fire by Rome, uh, that uh, there was something enormously liberating about, uh, partly liberating, I think, uh, for Shakespeare to think about a world that was not a Christian world. Yes. Uh, a, a world in which he could suspend for a moment the uh, overarching theological assumptions uh, in, in, in which he was raised and which he, as far as we know, largely accepted, but that somehow it's all taken away and you can think hard 
about politics, particularly, and about sex as well. Politics and sex, those two great subjects, which are his, uh, what he allows himself in plays like Julius Caesar or Antony Cleopatra uh, to, or, or Coriolanus to think hard and seriously yes. about. And I agree that there's something thrilling about what happens to his imagination and to our imagination when we're taken into that it's world. extraordinary. And also because uh, beyond the, uh, the, the Christian debates that, that, that rang about his ears as a child, there was also pagan Warwickshire, which seems to me to have, have gone in very deeply and for, that he accepted very deeply, which united him uh, to Rome. Um, and and uh, the, the pagan Shakespeare can afford, has, has, a, has a religious role, almost a religious costume, which allows him uh, to not entirely commit to uh, the Christian options. It, it's never clearer than when you try and uh, teach Hamlet and your students ask you, what on earth kind of a cosmology uh, is this uh, that you experience through Hamlet's father's ghost? And the answer is no known cosmology. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, it's remarkable how he was able to invent his own worlds. I think thanks to Warwickshire, really. But I think of Warwickshire as, as, as present, the, the, that world is very much present in Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes. Uh, really more okay. than, than uh, in the uh, city uh, oh, of yes. Julius Caesar. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No um, uh, I'm going to jump in here, gentlemen, because while I could listen to the two of you riff on Shakespeare all night, I know that you don't have all night. And I just wonder if for um, those people who are listening who have not read Stephen's book, if Stephen would mind um, answering riffing on the following question, namely, you have given us a quite delightful panorama of all the ways in which Shakespeare's world is not our world. And yet you've also written a book um, about Shakespeare's tyrants, which very much applies to our world. And I wonder if you could summarize something of that for the people who haven't yet read it. Yes, thank you, Susan. I, I, I would say that Shakespeare uh, brooded all his life uh, about how it was possible for people, societies, uh, which which consist of people who always look out after their own interests, want to protect themselves, think about their children, uh, think about their property, how they fall into the hands of catastrophic leaders. Why is it, why does this happen? Uh, and he didn't think of this or represent this in relation to his own particular world. He may or may not have been alluding to uh, to Elizabeth I or to, to uh, James, but it doesn't matter. He thought that this was a constant threat in society. What happens? How is it possible that people don't uh, protect themselves? How can they fall into this? This is not Shakespeare's thought alone. It's, it's a thought that, that uh, Montaigne brooded on, that in his wonderful, crazy way, Cervantes, uh, thought about how, wh why do these things happen? Uh, and in Shakespeare's case, uh, he allowed himself over a, uh, a, a remarkable career to create different circumstances, to imagine different circumstances in which this happens and to, to analyze, to anatomize how a society gets into this catastrophic trouble, which for Shakespeare ultimately resolves itself into civil war that Shakespeare's model for what happens when a society really falls into the wrong hands is not only that you experience tyranny, but that the only way you're likely to get out of the tyranny is through a civil war, which is the worst thing that can happen, which as Shakespeare understood to a culture where brothers are killing brothers, uh, where families are torn apart and where, where everything is lost. Uh, so, in thinking about this, he, of course, he doesn't think about this 
in the way that a, a Machiavelli or a Hobbes thinks about it. This is not a political philosophy. He thinks about it with names of characters like Buckingham uh, or Hastings or Richard. And using those terms, those pieces, he, he plays out imaginatively what happens that leads what looks like a perfectly viable social order into terrible trouble. And I think, or at least I, the premise of my book is that it's worth attending to his account of how this happens. Uh, and I could spell out various please. versions of it, but yes, uh, uh, if, uh, if for an American uh, now, uh, the image of January 6th uh, in Washington of the wild mob uh, with that crazy character with the, the horns uh, on his head and, and all the rest of them bursting into the Capitol is a perfect Shakespearean image of one of the ways in which it happens. In this case, uh, Shakespeare thought that a, uh, a factionalized, that, that, a, that a relatively well-meaning but relatively weak leader would allow uh, or uh, would make it possible for a bitterly factionalized party politics to arise uh, in which the two parties refuse any longer to compromise, in which they hate each other intensely, which they can't even stand to hear the voices of the other, I mean, let alone understand what the issues are. Uh, and that that would set the stage for the awakening of a certain kind of, of populism that would draw upon uh, this, the rage that is always there uh, with people who are, after all, extremely badly treated by their society, or feel badly treated, or feel that someone else is getting something that they don't have. And Shakespeare depicts this in Henry VI extraordinarily powerfully uh, through uh, uh, an uprising led by a, uh, a mad demagogue named Jack Cade, who's actually being manipulated by someone much more powerful and much uh, clever, but off the scene, uh, off the largely uh, off the stage, behind the scenes, uh, and that Shakespeare depicts that uprising, which uh, culminates in an attack on education, hate, hating people who create schools, hating the printing press, uh, a, a kind of mad festival of uh, rage. Uh, which is then uh, shut down upon by, by the people who let it go uh, and leads in turn to the rise of, in Shakespeare's account, of a real tyrant, of uh, Richard III. And the question then that Shakespeare asks himself, Richard III is a grotesque person to be the king. Uh, he's, everyone understands that he's a, a liar, that he's perverse, that he's dangerous, uh, that he's violent, that he's totally self-interested, that he's grotesquely arrogant. So how is it possible that he, of all people, could become the king? And then Shakespeare has a rather, I think, brilliant account of the way in which people enable such a person to come to power for a variety of different reasons. Some people because uh, they don't quite get it into their heads that he's really as bad as that. Some people, because they do know that he's as bad as that, but they somehow forget. And they think that the institution is the institutions will hold, that there'll always be an adult in the room, that there'll be some kind of constraint, traditional norms will be observed. And then some people think that they'll be able to take advantage. They'll get something from it they'll always be able to stay one step ahead of the rising tide of evil. Uh, and their collaboration makes it possible. Because Shakespeare never thought that's one of the virtues of being a playwright. You never, it's, this is not a one man show. Shakespeare never thought one person mm. could ever get to power that way. So person would inherit the, the throne, so what? People have to obey the person who 
inherits the throne. This was a perception that was had by Montaigne's friend, Etienne de la Boissy, who said, how, would, how can we resist tyranny? And the answer is just don't listen to him. If he tells you to bring him a cup of coffee, don't bring him a cup of coffee. What, what do you care? He's all just one person. But of course, that's not the way a society works. A society works with large numbers of people collaborating, but in Shakespeare's account, collaborating in their own suffering, collaborating in their own misery. Uh, and Shakespeare, that is the situation that Shakespeare uh, was haunted by. And haunted by particularly because he understood that these forms of enabling and collaboration depend upon manipulating large numbers of people. And he was one of the great manipulators of large numbers of people who's ever lived. He managed to get, he managed to make his fortune with it. He managed to get 3000 people in an, in an afternoon to pay their pennies to listen to his fantasies. He knew what it was to do this. He understood deeply from the inside. And that's another thing that one grasps from, I think in a deep way from uh, Shakespeare's world of understanding how to work your medium, uh, understanding the way in which the medium is the source of, in the case of Shakespeare's world, the theater is a kind of model as our media are models for how power is manipulated. And Shakespeare has the deepest possible understanding of his own medium and its relationship to the, the powers that be in his world. Elizabeth was a genius at using the media of her world. And Shakespeare understood this from the beginning, just as our own contemporary politics is now totally bound up with our own new media. Shakespeare's medium was a new one. The first theater is from the 1570s. This is brand new. This is like our internet. Uh, and Shakespeare is one of the pioneers of figuring out how to use this medium. And that is that part of the cleverness, not just cleverness, the depth of his understanding of how uh, political life in his world is created, functions. Uh, let, this is a moment in which I, okay, we have one question. Let me uh, invite all of our listeners to add their questions um, to the F&A or the Q&A function. But I want to ask you one of my own. I found your opening remarks, Stephen, you know, just terribly resonant with me about the fact that uh, for five years, this horrible man was in our heads. And um, even though I lived in Berlin through most of that era, it was simply impossible to ignore him. Um, and, uh, you know, the suggestion that just turning off the noise is, I mean, it was a deep blessing, although of course we don't know how long the noise is going to be turned off at this point. And it's quite disturbing for anybody who's been following American politics at the sub-presidential level in the last months. What, do you think there are lessons that we can learn from Shakespeare on this score? Um, I mean, the internet is, of course, very different from the theater. But um, are there ways in which he can help us deal with this um, very new form of tyranny? And it's, of course, very interesting. You also said at the beginning, uh, you could say whatever you like. No one is going to put you in jail or, or, or nail your ear to the pillory. Um, and that is still true in the United States and it will presumably remain true because the better form of censorship is just flooding the airwaves with so much noise that one can't get away from it. But I'm, I'm just wondering if there are things that we can take away or if Shakespeare, you know him so much better, both of you know him so much better than I do. Um, if Shakespeare, 
Beer contents himself often in quite terrifying ways of simply describing um, the growth of tyranny without ever suggesting a way out. That's why some of them are called tragedies, of course. Yes. I mean, I do think that Shakespeare thought, I mean, uh, that very often the, the story is not a happy one uh, and there is not an easy, happy solution. That said, I do think that it's not only uh, a bleak, uh, uh, no exit uh, account. I think that we could say, we could extract several things that maybe are useful from uh, Shakespeare. One uh, is that uh, you can and you can't simply turn away, at least Shakespeare wasn't inclined to turn away from his own medium, which as I say, he thought was very much bound up with, with, uh, with terrifying powers. I mean, that Shakespeare understood that we're attracted to Richard III. We're fascinated by Macbeth. I mean, Shakespeare uh, profited from this fascination, loved this, but at the same time, he did use precisely his medium to explore what is terrifying, what is uh, what uh, should trigger resistance. He did it within his medium. That is to say, so I'm I'm the last person to figure out how our own current. I'm not on tick uh, on TikTok or uh, on Facebook. Uh, I'm the last person to, to give you advice, anyone advice from that, but except to say that understanding from the inside how the medium works is what Shakespeare devoted himself to. So that's one piece of it. A second piece is that Shakespeare thought that was fascinated by the idea of service. So it seems like a modest thing to say, uh, Susan, but uh, Shakespeare was really interested in what it meant to feel that you uh, were in service. Uh, some of Shakespeare's most remarkable characters in the middle of plays of unimaginable bleakness are characters who say, as the nameless servant in King Lear, who sees his master torturing someone who's suspected of being a spy, of, tra of treason. And you, Shakespeare lived in a world in which people were tortured all the time for exactly that kind of thing. And this is actually someone at the very top of the society. And the servant comes forward and says, I've served you all my life, but never ser better service have I done you than to tell you to stop. Mm. Now that's an amazing thing to write in the early 17th century, an incredible thing. The character is actually killed, the servant for saying it, but Shakespeare was fascinated by a kind of service that would make you want to come forward and say, stop. And one thing in our own, I, I don't feel uh, giddily optimistic about the world that I live in, but one thing that did happen in the last year in my country is that enough people came forward who actually were on the other side of the political fence for me, the Republican, Republicans working in Georgia on the election and so forth, who came up and said, no, stop. Uh, and they did it out of, as far as I could tell, out of a sense of public service, because they thought that that was their role. So reinforcing some kind of civic sense of service seems to me a very important thing uh, for us uh, to try at least. Uh, yeah, to do. I agree. do either of you have something to say about civil war? Because as you pointed out, that was for Shakespeare, the worst possible outcome. And yet, despite the few Republicans, to all of our surprise, Liz Cheney, even, um, all of the Republicans who um, did step up and at least temporarily save a democratic order, um, those of us who have been following US politics know that it's very, very shaky. And the sense of cold civil war in the United States is very strong. So I wonder if there's any way in which either of you think that Shakespeare uh, provided some insight into, uh, you know, first of all, what 
gets it going and if there's anything that can get it to stop. One thing to say is that Shakespeare thought assassinating a rotten leader is probably not a clever move uh, because it, it uh, can only, is only likely to encourage the very thing that you think you're trying to stop. Uh, but maybe that, uh, that doesn't apply to, uh, to all situations in all worlds, but that is, Shakespeare didn't think to take Julius Caesar uh, seriously, that that was actually the, the, uh, a smart way of trying to stop something that you see is happening. What right. he did th uh, think in the Coriolanus uh, might be possible was to play hardball politics, mm -hmm. not to be an idealist. The characters in Coriolanus, Sicinius and Brutus are like fairly low level ward politicians, as we say in America, but they actually succeed in stopping what looks like uh, a very bad situation, what looks like it might devolve into a civil war. And they succeed by playing very, very hardball politics. So uh, we, could, we could say that those are two, how should we say, positions uh, of, of that in which Shakespeare is trying to think about how you would stop something like this a real catastrophe from happening. But you, one way you can't stop it is to blithely assume that the norms are gonna hold. The norms don't, there's, there's, as we learned, we thought we had all those things absolutely secure. They could be ignored. Uh, you can't count on them. I am going to read a question from um, Mariana Malespina. Uh, hello, Mariana from Berlin here. Thank you for this lecture. At, at 7.29, somebody's been paying exact attention, you made an important point about the rage of the people at chaos uh, and injustice. Trump was, after all, a product of the huge rage building up in America because of ever raising gaps in wealth. Raises, rage is easy to exploit. I'm Italian, but lived in New York City for 23 years, and I go back to Italy regularly. As I go and going back to Italy regularly, I could see how rage is having an impact on their choices as well. Rage and anger are dangerous things. Any comments? I do think that that, uh, as I said, um, it is difficult uh, to take in if you've to go back to Carrie's uh, comfortable comfortable pandemic. If you live a comfortable life, it's rather difficult to take in how angry uh, you can feel. And it's also perhaps difficult to grasp how relatively easy it is or it has been to turn that anger particularly into, a, into how should we say, a racist direction. Mm -hmm. To think, I'm not getting it and they're getting it. Those Black people are getting it. Those Hispanics are getting it. I mean, they're not, they're taking it away from me. They don't think that, that's why Mariana's remark about class is so interesting. They don't think I'm being manipulated by these multi-billionaires, by the Koch brothers, by, they think the, uh, the black lady in the corner is doing it to me. And it turns out to be quite easy to do that, but, and it, it behooves, people, I should say, just like me, uh, to actually grasp how angry mm -hmm. and how easy it is to, how angry you feel it's possible to feel. And because America is like the house of Atreus, it has a primal sin, which it never uh, resolved, uh, how easy it is to manipulate the consequence of that primal sin, that is to say the enslavement uh, of, Black Africans to turn that in the direction that we've seen it turned um, uh, into a kind of political gold, uh, which one party particularly has been very good at mining. Mm. And before that, the extirpation of the American Indian. Thank you, because that is really our primal sin. That is, that is the earlier one. I had the had the good fortune of having seven or eight weeks, thanks to my my uh, blessedly fortunate uh, uh, teaching life, which I 
share in that sense with Stephen. I took that time off and I motorcycled around the entire country and I didn't really know why I was doing it except that I wanted to sell my motorbike. I was 70 years old and I thought that was probably enough. But through a number of people I met, I discovered a completely different journey, which was a, a journey that was undergirded by a sense of, uh, of the Trail of Tears, uh, of all the terrible places uh, that are still there uh, for us to see what, uh, what we, speaking now as uh, an adoptive American, uh, what we did uh, at the very beginning. And uh, it's terrifying. Another thing that terrifies me is that uh, while I absolutely hear what Susan is saying about the noise and, and uh, Stephen likewise, I'm, I'm equally appalled by the thirst that I have found in myself for scandal, for bad news. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the daily papers are, are already the parents of this idea. There was a time when we didn't have daily newspapers and didn't expect horror uh, every day. Uh, now we do, and Trump became the circus master of an addiction, That's an, true. Ad an addiction to scandal. And I'm still shocked. I feel it. I feel that need calming, thank goodness, in his silence, and, and thank goodness for it, because I found that very scary as a feature of not only of the landscape of, of, of hugely justified rage, but of comfortable people like myself who became voyeurs. Uh, Carrie, that's brave and honest of you to say, because of course I found that in myself and as much of a relief as it's been to have him not dominating the news, I noticed that I click on stories about him still. Um, and it's, uh, it's troubling. So here is a question from Dominic Bonfilio um, to, for Stephen. One passage in your book that I found particularly incisive concerns the nature of power. And Dominic quotes, Shakespeare understood something that in our own time is revealed when a major event, the fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the housing market, a startling election result, manages to throw a garish light on an unnerving factor. Even those at the center of the innermost circles of power very often have no idea what is about to happen. Looking on from the margins, you dream that if you could only get close enough to this or that key figure, you would have access to the actual state of affairs and know what steps you need to take to protect yourself or your country. But the dream is a delusion. That's end quote from Stephen Greenblatt. But Dominic asks further, but at the same time, as you point out when discussing Richard III, one of the tyrant's essential attributes, according to Shakespeare, is the ability to force his way into the minds of those around him, whether they wish him there or not. Uh, let's see, though, so the question goes on. In other, in other words, the tyrant rises to power in part because he convinces both supporters and opponents of his inescapable ubiquity. Uh -huh. Can you say more about this odd property of the tyrant's power and perhaps of power in general? that it can seem both indestructible, yet in reality be extremely fragile from Shakespeare's perspective. It's a wonderful, rich uh, set of uh, 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 imbricated questions. Uh, I would, I'm, uh, I want to think about it. I mean, I have, I, in the nature of this occasion, I need to say something immediately. I want to think about whether there really is a uh, a tension between the two, uh, the the two pieces of of uh, Dominic's remarks. In the first case, I'm I confess I'm speaking of my own personal experience. But I, I, I'm I know people because of my my job really and the, where where I teach. And I know people who are very much caught up in the centers of what looks like. Uh, information, crucial information about politics and the economy and so forth and so on. And I've been amazed by how lost they are at key moments, not because they're not intelligent, they're fantastically intelligent and not because they're very they're inadequately informed, they're, they couldn't be better informed. And yet they completely get leveled the way I get leveled, knowing nothing uh, about uh, by contemporary events. 
And I can never tell, by the way, whether that's good news or bad news. Maybe it's good news that we, we can't ever predict what's happening because that connects to the second part of your, of Dominic's uh, remark, which is that, how should we say it's the, the Ceausescu effect uh, that I, I get that image of Ceausescu on his balcony doing the same thing he, done, he did 10,000 times before, waving his hands to the crowd, uh, thinking that all was going along the way it's been going along. And it turns out that they were shouting death to him. Uh, and five minutes later, he's gone. But, the, uh, but who seemed absolutely impregnable uh, and in forever. And so you could play that one out in a depressing way. You can play it out in a happy way. But because I'm of an optimistic temperament, ultimately, I want to say, yeah, that's actually part of the good news, which is that just when you think things are, we're in deep shit forever, uh, it turns out, well, it's all changed uh, and we can breathe again. Well, Kant, who did not have an optimistic temperament, he described himself as a melancholic, um, would have agreed that this is good news because he would have said it proves the possibility of human freedom. Yes. It's the, it, to go back to something else I was thinking, I thought about a lot in my life. It's the possibility of a swerve, uh, mm. an unexpected uh, swerve in, in the conditions of everything. Uh, of life, and uh, in in good times, we hope it's not. We hope it will continue in this uh, in the direction that's been going. But in bad times, it would be good to have it actually go in a surprisingly different direction. Carrie, do you have any thoughts about this weird quality of power that it can seem both absolute and ubiquitous? And on the other hand, it is often extremely fragile. And as to feeling powerless, all one has to do is read Barack Obama's last book and realize how powerless even the president of the United States was at many moments. So, yes. I'm terrified of power and uh, to the point where, uh, as my students will tell you, uh, I give everybody A as they come in through the door for the first class. Uh, as, as a way, I, I, it's not quite as quixotic as it sounds because I say, you all have A, have the grade of A, it's yours to lose rather than to gain, uh, which is a way of looking at it. Although in, in my classroom, they pretty much never lose it. And I've been told by uh, some students that I have given A to students who never actually showed up for a single class, which is the ultimate in, in the discarding of power. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm appalled by power. I recognize that it's inescapable in all kinds of ways. And the more you imagine you don't have power over people, the more you're probably ignoring the fact that you do. Um, so the fragility of power is, uh, is comforting to me um, because I loathe, I, I, I loathe the practice of it and, and even the existence of it, although that I suppose is inevitable, but everything that's been said so far is correct, I think. I am conscious of the fact that um, Stephen and his family are waiting for dinner and uh, that it's very kind of you to take a moment off from your vacation to join us. I want to ask if there's anybody else who would like to add a question or a comment and then ask um, both of you if you'd like to say a few words we don't have, I don't see anybody. Um, would you like to say a few words in closing? Stephen. I have uh, children and grandchildren. Uh, I think that the world will go on after I'm gone. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we'll have lots of, of, uh, uh, things to deal with, particularly because of the environment. Uh, and I think that uh, we will need to redouble our efforts as a civilization, as, a, uh, uh, as human beings to keep ourselves afloat at a time in which there's going to be, uh, as we've already experienced, uh, very ugly political forces at work 
political forces that won't be uh, unfamiliar if you've read Shakespeare or for that matter, if you've read Thucydides, uh, but that we will need to grapple with every day. What I hope we'll have are institutions that will enable us, that will be strong enough to enable us to weather the storms that are ahead. I had a remarkable conversation, and with this I'll close. I had a remarkable conversation with the, uh, uh, with the president of Latvia, uh, a man named Egil Levitz, uh, at, and about the, my book and about these issues. And he's, and I was talking about the remarkable courage that a small number of characters in Shakespeare show, moral courage uh, in their terrible crises. And he said, he thought that the goal of democracy was to reduce to a minimum the number of occasions in which people have to show remarkable moral courage, that the system actually should enable you to survive without constantly throwing yourself over the rails or risking your life. And I think it's a goal that we can have. We, we live in a society in America and in Germany, uh, uh, in, in many of the countries that I know that have institutions precisely that have been created out of terrible situations that enable people to rely to a considerable extent on the system to protect them from the horrible forces that are out there. And we need to strengthen those institutions because each of us individually may have some moral courage, but we can't expect everyone to come forward and throw themselves and say, stop, I'm not allowing you to do this even at the cost of my own life. Human beings won't do that. But over a long period of time, we've created institutions that, constitutions, laws, uh, that will protect us from the worst, but we have to defend them. We have to reinforce them. We can't trust that they'll just exist without our attention. And we've seen in my country how easy it is simply to throw them out, to ignore them. So we need to fight to reinforce them, to protect ourselves from disaster. Mariana Malespina says, uh, Stephen, that is absolutely true about what you say on sound and solid institutions. And yes, defend them is so crucial. I, I have to say I've never been shocked so much at the fragility of those institutions as I was in the last, or still am, since it continues to go on from the Republican side in the last five years. And your um, Latvian um, uh, acquaintance sounds to me a little bit too much like um, the line from Brecht's Galileo that's always quoted, unhappy the land that needs heroes. And it tends to be quoted actually out of context. I think, um, I think the land does need heroes. And uh, yeah. Do you want to... Um, Say anything in closing, Gary, so that... No, no, I'm just thinking it's, it's, it's always in my mind. Of course, that's an answer to unhappy the land that has no heroes, and that's capped by unhappy the land that needs them. And uh, it's right, but, but um, we will always need heroes, uh, I'm afraid. Hopefully, uh, fewer rather than more. Uh, Susan, this was lovely of you to assemble us here. Oh, thank you so thank much you for taking the time to join us, and I hope we'll see each other IRL yeah. um, one of these days, sooner rather yeah. than later. Soon. Soon.